that every knee will bow at the name of Jesus for all of us. And all will bow before you every time we look back. You are Lord. So Lord, we thank you for being our Savior. Thank you for being our God. We pray that you would bless us now. Bless singing and preaching this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Because of that, 
Now the Bible says, put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. What, what an amazing, amazing, amazing thought. Let's stay. Let's sing that 448. Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 11 is where we get the order for the uh, the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. It says in verse 23, For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he is betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks and break it, and he said, Take ye, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. And then further down in verse uh, just 27, it says, Who, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat of this bread and Drink of this cup of the Lord unworthily, then shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. So to be worthy of the Lord's Supper, you know, the Bible says that you have to be saved, part of, uh, you know, to be a saved member of a church. And that's why we're here today, is to take part of the Lord's Supper. But it's really just uh, the idea for it, the ordinance for it, why Jesus established it, is to remember what he's done for us and remember what he did on the cross in his salvation work. But at this time, we'll take the bread. That's uh, Brother Tom to pray for the bread. Dear Lord, I just uh, thank you for the opportunity we have to observe. The Lord's Supper today, Lord, as a church, I pray that you would just uh, bless the Lord, help us to remember the sacrifice you gave on Calvary that day, and ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
And when he had given thanks and break it, he said, Take eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup. Brother Rob to pray for the deacons. Heavenly Father, thank you um, for what this juice represents. Lord, mm -hmm. the shedding of your blood for each one of us. I uh, just pray that you would help each one of us never to forget that and to live our lives daily, Lord, for you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do off as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show forth the Lord's death till he come. Let's all stand together. We'll sing a congregational hymn. The men will come by and collect your cups. <laughs>
for your precious blood. Lord, thank you <coughs> for willingly going to, going to that cross for us, Lord. Undeserving, unworthy we were, but your love is greater. And Lord, we thank you for the ultimate sacrifice that you made for us. And we pray that you would bless us now, bless the preaching of your word, bless this offering, and we ask this all in Jesus' name. look at passage of scripture and you, you can find um, this account in any of the gospels but I'm going to look at Luke 19 today and we'll touch on a couple of the other accounts this is what is often referred to as Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem this would be the last time that Jesus would enter into Jerusalem and um, there was a lot that, there's a lot that's going to take place in the coming days of the life of Christ. And let me encourage you this week to take some time to read through the biblical accounts of the crucifixion and the resurrection of our Savior. Amen. Um, I, I think it would do us well to, to read through those passages of Scripture often, but more so this week, so we get an understanding of all that was going on uh, this past, uh, during this week. Luke chapter 19, we're going to start reading in verse number 28. Luke 19, verse 28 says, And when he had thus spoken, he went before, ascending up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass when he was come nigh to Beth, Bethany, and Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go ye into the village over against you, in the which at your entering you shall find a colt tied, whereon yet never man sat. Loose him. And bring him hither. 
And if any man ask you, why do ye loose him? Thus shall you say unto him, because the Lord hath need of him. And they that were sent went their way and found even as he had said unto them. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto them, Why loose ye the colt? And they said, The Lord hath need of him. And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereon. And as they went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice <coughs> for all the mighty works that they had seen. Saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven, and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for this account, Lord, of Lord, your triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And Lord, there was much that would happen in the coming days. And Lord, we just want to just Lord, try and for a few moments this evening just to get a, an understanding. I, I pray, Lord, that you would help us, Lord, to understand this passage and Lord, to just be ministered to. Lord, I pray the word of God would just pierce our hearts. Lord, if there's Lord, anything needs to be made right, Lord, that, that the Holy Spirit would be our conviction tonight, our, our teacher, our guide. I pray that you would use me in a powerful way, Lord, that the words that I speak tonight would be your words and not mine. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The name of Jesus throughout history has always evoked emotion. It's no different in those days than it is today. For the believer, the name of Jesus brings joy and jubilation. <coughs> it brings relief and hope. But unfortunately for many others, the name of Jesus evokes anger and even rage. As we're going to see in a few minutes, it's, it was no different in those times than it is today. The name of Jesus will evoke emotions all across the spectrum. Philippians tells us that wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. And as believers, we rejoice in knowing that. But for those that don't know the Lord, it evokes a, a feeling of, how dare you? Or a feeling of, you can't tell me what to do. No one can tell me what to do. Let me just kind of paint the picture of what's going on here. This is the time right before they're heading into the Passover, and every time the Passover, they would gather from the Passover. Large multitudes, large crowds would gather together. As they remembered what God had done for them in times past. Now according to Josephus, a Jewish historian, um, he estimates that the number of people in Jerusalem at the time was around 2 million. <coughs> Others have put the number somewhere around 250,000, 500,000. Bottom line is there was a lot of people there large multitudes of people to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles and the Passover. Because of the amount of the multitudes of people, the, the Roman authorities were on high alert, you would say. They, they didn't want any problems. So they were very mindful of what was taking place. They wanted to make sure that they maintained control. The Jewish leaders were trying to keep peace with the Roman authorities. The Passover is at hand. You have large multitudes of people. You have the Romans on the one side making sure that things don't get out of control. You have on the other side the Jewish leaders making sure that things with the Romans, they want to keep the status quo. We want to make sure we maintain a good relationship with the Romans. All these things are going on. In motion.
emotions are high. And the Lord Jesus Christ is about to come riding in to Jerusalem. Now many of them knew of the works of Christ, knew of the <coughs> teachings of Christ. They had heard him teach. They had heard his disciples speak. They had seen the miracles that Christ was doing. We know that throughout his ministry, the Pharisees were trying to do everything they can to silence him. So there was already high tension. And you put all of this together, and you could just for a second stop and just think about what that, that scene was like. I, I think sometimes when we read through this, we don't often get a true picture of what was really going on. You know, as Christ was riding into Jerusalem, we're going to touch upon these in a couple of minutes, but as he was riding into Jerusalem, it wasn't a situation where, you know, there was a few people like, oh, here he comes again to start trouble. No, we're talking rage. We're talking anger. We're talking high tension, high stress. There was a lot of volatile emotions right now. So Christ rides into Jerusalem in the midst of all of this. And you say, well, wait a minute. We, we call this his triumphal entry. Aha. Because in a week or so, Jesus would have the victory that he already had told told. <coughs> Now, they didn't understand what was about to happen. The disciples would understand that later. But all these things are going on. All these things are happening. Jesus is about to ride in to Jerusalem in fulfillment of the prophecy, which we're going to read in a second in, in, in the book of Zechariah. And the Pharisees and, and those that were against Christ, and there was many, this was about the last straw. But it's the Passover. What to do? So we're going to look at a few things of the emotions that were stirred on, upon the entry of Christ into Jerusalem. First thing I want to look at is there was emotions of joy. There was. You look at the passage that we read, and you look at verse number 37 in Luke 19, verse number 37, it says, And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen. Jesus comes in and they begin to rejoice. In, in some of the in some of the counter passages, and the wording is very similar in the counter passages. You see in verse thirty eight similar wording. It says, "Saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest." The first thing I see is that there was joy because they recognized who Christ was. There was a recognition of who Jesus was. Blessed is He. Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. Now listen, Jesus had told them. I find it ironic because, you know, the leaders were the ones who should be the ones who knew the writings. You would think that they would look with anticipation at what was about to happen. Now listen, you can kind of equate it. You know, we need to live our life in light that Christ could return right now. You know, and listen... Would we be ready if Christ returned? How would we know? Oh, we would know. You know how? Because the Bible tells us. There's ways you can know. They knew what the signs were. The problem is their self, their pride, was much greater than their hope in the coming Messiah. We're not going to spend too much time on this, but, you know, the Pharisees were enjoying their position of prominence. They were enjoying the authority that they were, you know, that was bestowed upon them. Oh, everybody looked up to them. They were the ones who were the authority, the religious leaders. But throughout Christ's ministry, he rebuked them. 
Why? Because they were not looking at, as the Bible says, the weightier matters, matters of the law. Oh, they would, you know, stand at the gate and look good and sound good, but they were neglecting mercy and compassion and the care for those that needed it. They were so concerned with themselves that they even neglected the things that were important. And Christ rebukes them. And that, listen, that was a point of contention. So you understand where this is coming from. You have all these leaders standing around, and here comes Christ, and you have the multitudes cheering. They must have been like, are you kidding? They had already been formulating ways to get rid of Christ. But the people knew who this was. When they say blessed is the blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord, you know what they're they're referring back to a passage of scripture back in the Psalms. Again, you know, the people, the multitude knew the writings. The leaders who should have known it either pretended they didn't or just were ignorant of it. In, in, in Psalm, you don't have to turn to it, but in Psalm 118 and in verse 22, the stone which the builders refused has become the head stone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad. And now listen, we sing that chorus. This is the day, this is the day which the Lord hath made. But we need to read it in context. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Then he says, save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. This is the day. You know what day it is? When the Lord triumphantly enters Jerusalem. Amen. You know, that, that little phrase in Psalm, we're going to talk about it in a couple of minutes. Save now. That's the word that they use for Hosanna. Amen. So it was a direct reference to a passage of scripture that many of the people knew. Blessed be the king. Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. That's a direct reference to that passage of scripture. So they recognized, there was joy because they recognized who Christ was. Let it be. They remembered the miracles that were performed. Because it says, okay, the whole multitude, in verse 37, of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen. Now listen, Christ did a, a, an enormous amount of miracles and works that he did. I believe, because this is directly following, or almost immediately following, the raising of Lazarus. Now listen, this had to be fresh in their minds. If you remember, we don't have time, but if you read back, in John chapter 11, and when it talks about this passage of Scripture, you know what I find? I don't want to say it's funny, but it, it kind of is. You know, when, when, he, when he raises Lazarus from the dead, when he gives him life again, they get so upset, they get so mad at him that they really want to kill him. But not only that, they want to kill Lazarus. Now, I want you to think about this. What does Lazarus do? You had the nerve to die and live again. <laughs> Somebody help me out here. They wanted read it. They, they wanted to kill Lazarus. Poor Lazarus. Guys, I just came back to life. <laughs> Listen. That type of of hatred. Um, really, there's no clear thinking. Um, you know, we live in a world today where there is this. And I hate to use this word, but that's kind of what it is. There's this rage yeah. Oh, yeah. that blinds people to any kind of any kind of common sense. Yeah. They've said that, and I've read things on this, that people can get so angry that they're, you've heard the expression, blinded by rage. Yeah. They are so upset, they can't even think clearly. And that's what's going on. Listen, uh, um, just a, as a side note, that's what's happening in Christianity today. I don't want to, you know, we're talking about joy, so I don't want to go, go down this road. But I think as Christians, it, it's time for us to get our head out of the sand. Because 
there is there is a, a real enemy and the attacks are getting stronger and more real and you know what's starting to happen they're starting to hit home and we have two choices you know we can either you know stand and say no or we can stand or we can you know run and say well you know it's okay it's not really worth it what, what is it that we're willing to stand for because listen we're, we're coming to a place where that anger towards Christianity, towards anything that has to do with Christ, is more and more real every day. They remembered the miracles that they experienced. Let me ask you a question. Are, are there miracles that we've experienced in our life? You say, well, wait a minute. I didn't see anybody raised from the dead. That's not what I'm talking about. But have we seen God do something in our life that's beyond explanation? Right. I'm going to ask you one more question. If we haven't, why? Because that same God that raised Lazarus is the same God on the throne today. He's the same God that dwells in every believer. The Spirit of God dwells in us. And listen, that same God can do miracles today, just like he did then. Amen. If we're not seeing miracles, I want to ask you why. It isn't because God's changed. Because I believe God wants to do the impossible. Amen. I believe that with all my heart. Amen. And I believe as we step out by faith, and as we just say, Lord, here it is. I, I want to see you do something impossible. Be ready. Because it's going to take you to places you never thought you could be. I believe it was D.L. Moody, and I'm probably going to you know, mess this quote up, but the world is not seeing what God can do with the <coughs> Listen, think about that. You know, we always hold back little pieces. And God says, just turn it all over. People say, well, that those things when Moody was around and Spurgeon and the Apostle Paul, they don't happen anymore. They don't happen anymore because we're not willing to surrender at all. Because God wants to do a work. <laughs> Those people were rejoicing because of the miracles they had seen. I want to see God do miracles. I want to see God do something that is beyond human comprehension. Amen. It would be great. Here's a small little thing that we can pray for. We have our, our, our Resurrection Sunday celebration. Wouldn't it be great if every single solitary seat in this church was filled? Amen. You'd say, well, yeah, Pastor, you know, people don't like to sit right next to each other. Yeah. <laughs> Get out of our comfort zone for about yeah. 45 minutes. Yeah. 45 minutes. We could do that. Who knows? Maybe the Lord will put somebody right next to you that needs to hear the gospel. And you're the vessel he's going to use to share the message. You say, well, I, I guess God could do that. No, God can do that. Amen. It would be a blessing to see this place filled. Amen. We need to pray that way. God Bring in people next week to hear the gospel message. We're going to go out. We're going to tell people, but Lord, you need to bring them in. We can't drag them in here. All we can do is tell them. And then watch God do the work. I, every time I think of something like that, I, my mind is always drawn back to Elijah and, and the, 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 the vessels of oil. I love that story. You know why? Because the oil never ran out. You know what ran out? The vessels, the vessels they were putting them in. The oil stopped when the vessels ran out. Listen, God's supply never runs out. Amen. Are we willing to trust him to do miracles? I want to see God do a miracle. There was joy because of everything they had seen. And there was joy because their hope was restored. Listen, they were living in oppression. You know, the, the Romans were oppressing them. Even their own leaders were oppressing them. It, it wasn't a good situation. But when Jesus came in, they were rejoicing. Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Their hope was restored. You know, there is always hope in Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hopelessness turns to hope. Despair turns to joy. Where once I was blind, 
and now I can see? You say, well, I don't, I don't have answers. Jesus does. Well, I don't see a way. Jesus can. Listen, I'm just telling you, there's going to be situations, okay? Not maybe, I'm just telling you, there's going to be situations in our life that we have absolutely no solution for. You probably are facing one now, or maybe you're going to face one this week, or maybe you just, and that sometimes we just don't have an answer. We don't know what to do. Can I tell you? Go to Jesus. Amen. Say, well, you know, is Jesus going to make money fall out of the sky? If he wants to. Listen, we, we can go around this room. We're not going to do that. We can go around this room, and, and just people can testify of how God has provided in ways that they never envisioned. We've all had times in our life where there was, there was need. It could have been a physical need. Could have been a medical need. Could have been a financial need. It could have been a spiritual need. And I'm always the kind of person, and I, I pray, I say this, and now my pride's going to get in the way, it's going to happen again, but, you know, I try to kind of get away from that, you know, okay, so I have a problem, all right, Lord, I'm going to pray, but in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, okay, here's a checklist of about six ways, Lord, and I think this can work. <laughs> now listen, I'm, I'm just telling you, <laughs> this is the way my brain works. I, I, I have to have solutions and plans, and you know, and that's the way my mind works. And you know what I found? <laughs> and you know, God is so good. He really is. Because he'll answer the prayer. But but not according to one of those choices that I made. And I stand back in awe and I think to myself, man. Why do I do that, Lord? Because you know what? You're, you're not limited. I am. You're not. And there is always hope in Jesus. You know, choir sang that song a couple of months back. My hope is Jesus. Love that song. Because, listen, when we have nowhere to turn, and we have no one to turn to, Jesus is there. And he cares, and he hears, and wants to know, and wants to be there, and is always there for us, no matter what the situation. Their hope was restored. So there was joy at the triumphal entry when Christ entered in Jerusalem. Number two, there was confusion. You say, huh? Confusion? There was confusion. Confusion was kind of my middle name. <laughs> Sometimes I kind of sit there and I, and you know what the problem is? I think about too many things at once. And then they all get jumbled up. I, I, it's funny because I was just, I think it was telling Tom. I don't know if it was Tom or, or who I was talking to. But sometimes I'm leaving music and, I, and I'll glance down at the book and I'll read the first line or first verse and look up and, you know, try to pretend like I know what I'm doing, still wave my hand and look down and then I'll go to the second line for the first verse. So I'm kind of just singing all this. I look up and I was like, well, that's not right. <laughs> And I'll just kind of stop singing to get my bearings. Do you think I'm trying to catch my breath? <laughs> Too many different things going on. Confusion. You say, how, what do you mean by confusion? Letter A, the donkey or the colt. I bet you never thought you'd see donkey as a, as a point on a sermon, did you? <laughs> I thought of that earlier today. I was like, donkey? I don't think I'd ever, ever use that in one of those. No point. It says, okay, in verse number uh, 30. He says, go, to the, go ye into the village over against you, in the which at your entering ye shall find a colt tied, whereon yet never man sat. Loose him, and bring him hither. And if any man ask you, why do you loose him? Thus shall ye say unto him, because the Lord hath need of him. What is Jesus doing? A couple of things going on here. You don't have to turn there. But this is a fulfillment, a direct fulfillment of the prophecy in Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Daughter of Zion is the city of Jerusalem. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation. Praise the Lord. Lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. It's a direct fulfillment of that prophecy. Again, another confirmation that the people should have known that this is the Messiah. Let me just throw this in there. This is a side note to this. In verse 32 it says, And they that were sent went. 
you know, I, I thought of this as I was putting this together. I thought, you know, we don't know anything about those people that went to get the, the coal other than when Jesus sent them, they went. Yeah. Now listen, this task may have seemed insignificant to them, <coughs> but it had a monumental impact. That's right. Sometimes when we're called to do something for the Lord, we look at it and we go, oh, that's so, that's like a nothing job. Listen, when God calls you to do something, there is nothing, there is no job that is a nothing job. Those people that went to get that call, they were part of the fulfillment of this prophecy. And they that were sent went. Now, the, a, a colt or a donkey was never, I shouldn't say never, was not the way that most people envisioned a king entering a city. The people wanted a king who would take over, destroy Romans, and restore Jerusalem, and put us back in the power that we once had. We want to be free from this. We want to be, we have freedom that we didn't have. Here comes the king, you know. And Jesus comes in on a donkey. Now listen, at times there were leaders, kings, who did come in on a donkey. But here's what's interesting. Whenever they did ride in on a donkey, you know what they came as? Not as a warlike leader, but as a messenger of peace. And the Bible tells us that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Amen. He came with a message of peace. You know that peace that we have in Christ? The peace that you experience when you, when you ask Christ for salvation and he <laughs> saves you. And you know that your sins have been forgiven. We observe the Lord's table today. What a great song there is. A fountain filled with blood. What a great song. He came as a messenger of peace. Conquering kings would usually come in on majestic horses, fanfare. Nope. This also signified the humility of Christ. You know, Christ was the ultimate picture of humility. He watched his disciples' feet. And, and it's so humbling to me and convicting when I allow pride in my own life because I think of the example that Christ set before us. This is the, the Son of God, the Messiah, the King of kings, Lord of lords, and the ultimate picture of humility is Christ. So the donkey, there was the garments in verse 35. It says, and they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. You say, well, what does that have to do? The garments um, was an expression of joy, and it was an expression that symbolized a royal procession. Again, their idea was, oh, here comes a king who's going to free us. If you read over in John, we're not going to uh, turn there, but the companion passage to this passage in John chapter 12, verses 12 through 19, um, it talks about the palms. And we talk about Palm Sunday. Well, what do the palms symbolize? Palms were a symbol of victory. It was a symbol of Jewish nationalism. If you, and you can see in Revelation 7, 9 that it is a, a symbol of victory. It symbolized what they were looking for was a political king. They were joyful. King is coming. We sing that song, the king is coming. But we're talking about it in the fact that Jesus is returning. They said, oh, the king is coming, he's here. But they were looking for something a little bit different. I read this quote, it, it didn't sign it to a person, so I don't know who the person said. It says, by waving palm branches, which is a Jewish national symbol, the people hail Jesus as the divinic king and echo the language of Psalm 118, which we've read before, hoping that Jesus is the promised Messiah. Most of the crowd probably understood the title king of Israel in a political and military sense, still hoping that Jesus would use his amazing powers to resist Roman rule and lead the nation to independence. See, their oppression was so great, this is what they wanted. They were looking for a national or a political savior instead of a spiritual savior. And listen, there's a, a today I, I think it's called the social gospel. And I'm all about helping people and, and about community. And I think we need to reach our community. We need to reach people. And we need to help people whenever we need to be helped. But listen, the greatest need that people have is a spiritual need. It is not a physical need. It is not a material need. It is a spiritual need. 
And if we neglect the spiritual need for, 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 for the physical need, then we have failed. We, we can do all the nice things in the world. And if we never, ever, ever, ever tell people how they can be saved, we fail. What they needed was a spiritual savior. I can only imagine what their thoughts were when days later Jesus would be crucified. Oh, we just we were proud. It was for victory. We were symbolizing, we were rejoicing because the victorious king was here. Ah. Jesus was coming in victory. But not the victory they were looking for. He was coming in victory over death Amen. and sin Amen. and the grave. Amen. And in a week he would rise victoriously out of that grave. He's alive today. Amen. So the garments of palm. The word Hosanna in John chapter 12, verse 13. Uh, verse 13 as I mentioned before, that word means save now or save us, we pray. You know, they got this part of it right. They were rejoicing. Save us. They needed to be saved. Save us, we pray. That's a good way of praying because that's what it said in Psalm 118, verse 26, 27. Save us, we beseech you. You know, as a side note, we need, to, we need to praise and worship Jesus the way that God commands us to praise and worship him. Not, not the way we want to. There, there's a lot of things being done in the name of Christ today that we call worship. It isn't worship at all. You say, well, how could you possibly know that worship is about the heart? Because all the attention is on man and not Christ. And when all the attention is on man and we take the attention off of Christ, that's not worship. They were expecting freedom from Roman oppression. But the, the funny thing is, the Romans, I don't believe the Romans were even fearful at all. You say, well, how could you know that? Well, if you think about it, when they came before them, they, they went before, think about this, they went before, the, the, you don't read too many things going on. When they, when they brought Christ before Pilate, you know, I find nothing wrong with what do you want to do? I mean, nobody wanted to make a decision. If they were so fearful of Christ, they would say, hey, that's it. That's the man. There was confusion. There was joy. <coughs> it wasn't directed the right way. Let me see. There was betrayal. I'll move quickly to these. Letter A. There was a ruler. Boy, I tell you. You start doing something for Christ. You start speaking out. You start saying, thus saith the Lord. You better be careful. <laughs> Listen, if you don't think so, there's people plotting right now. And I don't say that with any pride. I'm just being honest. Look at what's going around in the world today. In, in John chapter 11, let's turn there real quick. In John chapter 11, and in verses 47 and, and uh, yeah, 47 and 48. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. If we let him alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and our nation. Boy, they were so concerned. They take away our place and our nation. You know, if you read in Acts, when the disciples <laughs> faced these similar confrontations, you know what they said? We ought to obey God rather than men. Yeah. And let me tell you right now, we ought to obey God rather than Amen. men. And there's a lot of people standing up and saying, thus saith the Lord. And that's okay. You can say whatever you want to do. But I'm going to say, thus saith the Lord. Right. And people don't like it. The ironic thing is the, the, the rulers are all plotting. The Pharisees are all plotting. If you read from John chapter 12, verse 19, the Pharisees therefore said amongst themselves, perceive ye how ye prevail nothing. Behold, the world is going after him. We've tried everything. And we're failing miserably. Guess what? Jesus is victorious. Amen. And the world will try everything they want to try to, to they, they, listen, they've tried to, they've tried to destroy the word of God. Amen. Guess what? We still got the word of God. Amen. Read throughout history. 
They tried to destroy Christians. The darkest period, I believe, in all of history is when tens of millions of Christians were martyred because they would not renounce the fact that there is no salvation through baptism. That's right. And they were murderously martyred in some horrible ways. Amen. And guess what? There's still many Christians today. They tried to destroy the disciples. And the world, and they spread the gospel more and more. You know, when you get to Matthew 26, their final plot was, hey, we have to kill him. Today, there's many plotting, so to speak, against Jesus. They, they don't want you saying the name of Jesus. You can't pray in Jesus' name anymore in any public square. There's no other name to pray. They're plotting against his authority. Jesus can't tell me what to do. Listen, Jesus is our Lord yeah. and our Savior. Yeah. And there is no other authority that we need to honor except the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. So they're trying to plot against his authority, his, his, his name, his word. Oh, that, that's not the Bible. Yes, it is. Don't let anybody ever tell you that this is not the word of God. Don't let them tell you it contains the word of God. No, it doesn't. It is the word of God. Every word, cover to cover, beginning to end, is wholly inspired by God. Amen. You have the rulers plotting. You have Judas' treason. You know, the thought of this, you know that Christ, throughout his ministry, treated Judas like a friend. Like a good friend, like a confidant. You know, he was the keeper of the bag. He was a confidant. I, I thought of this. I, I, you know, he was somebody who was a close friend. He never, ever, ever, ever made up anything other than that. And for filthy lucre, he betrayed him. Judas is treason. Now listen, before we think, oh man, I never want to be like those people. Matthew 26, Peter's denial. Listen, Peter had good intentions. Lord, I won't deny him. But before the cock crows three times, you will deny me. No, I'm sorry, before the cock crows, you'll deny me three times. No, Lord. As soon as that, that young girl came over, oh, I know you. <laughs> you're, you're the one that was talking with, you were with that Jesus, weren't you? Boy, Peter must have been terrified. This is the guy that pulled out a sword every time somebody confronted him. What did he say? Wasn't me. Nope, you got you got me mistaken. That was some other guy. All right, you give him a pass. Then it says the, the, the maid or the maiden came over and said, You're the one that you were talking the same things that Jesus was talking. And again. And the minute he denied him the third time, he looked over and what did he see? The gaze of the Savior. I can't even imagine. It. So before we're too hard on him, listen. What if, what if we were confronted with that? Think about the emotions that are going on. We painted the picture of everything that's happening, and all of a sudden you see they, 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 they're taking Jesus to be crucified, and somebody runs up to you and says, you, you're with him! What are you going to do? It's very easy to say, I wouldn't deny it, but if there's two or three people standing behind ready to do the same thing to you, I don't know. You know, we'd all like to say, yeah, I will. <coughs> a lot easier said than done. So there was joy, betrayal. Sorry, there was joy, confusion, betrayal. I was going to end it at three. Then I thought of this one. This is a quick one. There was sorrow. You know, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, it says he wept over the city. Right? And I thought of that. And I thought, you know, why did he weep over the city? You know why? So he could see who really didn't love them. Right. You know, when we reject God, it brings sorrow. God, you know why? Because he knows. Jesus knew what the outcome was going to be. And because of their lost condition. You know, the Bible still says he's not willing that any should perish. Amen. Thank you, Lord. He desires for all to be saved. Man, that should be the burden of our hearts. You know, when we fall, when we stumble, when we fail, when we deny the Lord, we say, don't say that. We never do that. Yeah, we do.
think of that. Think of, you know, I, 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 whenever I read that story, I always think of what Peter, what must have gone through Peter. You know, it doesn't, the Bible doesn't say that Jesus said anything to Peter. <coughs> just looked at him. I'll tell you what, that would have been enough for me. Yeah. Yeah. Can you imagine that? The look of a Savior. The minute he says, oh no, that wasn't me. When I think of that, it breaks my heart because I think of those times. You know what? If somebody was belligerent, somebody was angry, and I was like, oh, you know what? We've all been there. And then you walk away and we're like, oh, that's you. You know what, though? Let me encourage you with this. Think about what the Lord did with Peter. He loved him. He loved Peter. And Peter accomplished great things for the Lord. And listen, who was a bolder witness? Who, you know, who went to go talk to Cornelius? Who, who, who was out there preaching at Pentecost? He stand there and proclaim, Jesus is the way. They thought he was drunk. He says, no, I'm just speaking so you understand. Amen. And you, and you, and you, and you. And you know what? Man, God used him to do incredible things. But listen, there was failure in Peter's life, just like in ours. So as we kind of think about all the emotions that were taking place, and everything that was leading up to what is a joyous celebration and the resurrection of our Savior, let's not forget, man, there was emotions were high. As we think about all that took place this weekend, it was still tremendous. But praise God. He's alive today. Praise God for the salvation that we have in Christ. Let's go tell somebody this week. Let's fill this place up on Sunday. Listen, if we have to make more pancakes, we'll make more pancakes. Hey. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Armin. <laughs> I'll, listen, I'll throw an apron on. I'll come help you, brother. <laughs> Thank you, all right. Amen. Listen, there is nothing greater. Wouldn't it be wonderful if some lost soul came forward on Sunday? Amen. Broken hearted, weeping. Said, I need to be saved. You know, we, we, we went to uh, the, the Brother Jimmy Powell's church. They, Dave Kissel was there preaching this, yesterday. Great message, powerful message, um, encouraging message, but it, it was awesome because listen, you just never know. You always have to be prepared. And it was awesome because how could I have an opportunity to lead someone to the Lord? Hey. Listen. Amen. You never know. You can leave here and you can walk to Wawa and somebody could be there and you say, hey, I want to invite you to, to, to our church for this week. You say, man, I was looking for a church. Open door. You just never know. Like when God can use you. But you gotta be looking with open eyes. And be ready at any moment. So listen, it's, it's a tough world out there. But we have the answer. Why? Because we have victory in Jesus. Amen. And you know, it was a triumphant entry. But the best is yet to come. And we will celebrate the resurrection of our Savior next week. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much. For just for all that took place there, Lord, all that would befall you this week, Lord. But Lord, you willingly went to that cross for us. Because you loved us. Because you died for us. You're alive today, Lord. And for those of us that have placed our faith and trust in you, Lord, we know that one day we'll be with you. And Lord, until then, Lord, there's work to be done. So give us opportunities this week to share the gospel, to tell others about Jesus. Lord, we, we, we want to see you do something impossible this week, Lord. Lord, whether it's filling this place up or, Lord, just seeing souls saved, Lord, we're, we're just begging you to do something great here, Lord. For your glory, not for ours. <coughs> it's not about us, Lord. It's all about Jesus. And so, Lord, we just want to see you do a, a great work in our midst. Pray that hearts would be stirred, souls would be encouraged. And, Lord, as we see Lord, your hand working in our lives and in our church <coughs> and in the lives of those that are lost. Pray, Lord, that you would 
stir their hearts that they would know they have a need that we need to meet. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I'll stand and sing uh, Jesus paid it all for the summer vacation. If you want to pray, the altar's open. Um, just think about the opportunity we have this week to share of the upcoming Resurrection Sunday and we get to celebrate somebody that doesn't have that hope, you know. We have an awesome story to tell, so be sure to share. The first line is, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Yeah. You know, if somebody were to pay a great debt that you could never pay in your life, and really just pay it off for you, what would your response be towards that person? And I just thought about that as we get ready to pray and close the service, that he paid a debt we can't pay. Amen. We can work our whole life to pay that debt off, and we can't ever pay it. Mm-hmm. How are we going to respond for the payment that he gave to us? So, Amen. let's have a word of prayer. Hopefully we'll be able to share the message with someone this week. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord, just thank you for the opportunity we have as a church to just um, celebrate your resurrection next week, Lord. I pray that as we go forth this week that we would take that message and share it to as many people as we can as we come in contact with this week. Lord, give us a good week. Bring us back safely next week to worship your resurrection. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God, thank you. God bless you. Be here.